First at five, ten news with Ron Wilson and Jessica Rowe. Tonight, the terror campaign, four Sydney siders arrested over political arson attacks. A Sydney family's agonising vigil after a violent bag snatch. I'm counting on, on God, Allah, you know, to, to help us. And a watery wipeout, thousands stranded in deadly floods. Good evening. Also tonight, outrage over the kit that pushes school kids to fight for their rights. But first this evening, the Labor MP under siege. Crime fighter Tony Stewart's electorate office firebombed again. Police have detained two juveniles and two adults over the attacks. For the second time in 48 hours, the ALP candidate for Bankstown found himself a target. A cowardly attack aimed at intimidating me, intimidating my office and trying to intimidate the community. Despite increased police patrols since the first firebombing, this latest attack also went undetected. Because of the darkness, you wouldn't actually see them from the street, so they could do the damage inside and get out fairly quickly. This happened too many times and uh, been going on for quite some time. It's, it's wrong, you know, it's disgrace, mate, disgraced Australia, right? Not since the late John Newman has a New South Wales Member of Parliament been the subject of such terrorism. And like Newman, Tony Stewart has made local crime his key platform. I've been targeting these sorts of hoods for the last four years. It's well known that I've received threats in the past year, which were more intimidation rather than death threats. As the office burned, four people, including two juveniles, were detained by police for questioning. At the end of the day, we're talking criminals, we're talking hoodlums, um, who obviously don't like what Mr Stewart's doing. Despite Mr Stewart's brave front, police have confirmed security measures between now and the state election will be reviewed and radically upgraded. I would assess the options available and make a choice based on what is best for the community and my own protection as well. Despite the attacks, the Labor candidate says he'll stop short of employing a 24-hour bodyguard. Tim Collett, 10 News. And we've uh, just heard through that a short time ago police officially charged one of those arrested with a number of offences over that firebombing. The remaining three are still helping police with their inquiries. The gloves are off in the state election campaign over law and order. Kerry Chikorovsky warning our police commissioner to mind his own business and stay out of politics. The opposition leader came to Ashfield to announce her ethnic affairs policy. But it's the pledge of 2,500 extra police that has brought Commissioner Peter Ryan directly into the campaign, declaring the Goulburn Training Academy just wouldn't be able to cope. Well, it would just be impossible to put them through the academy, not without reducing our standards. But the police commissioner wouldn't be drawn on whether he needed 2,500 extra officers. I'd rather not get involved in police numbers at this stage. Kerry Chikorovsky was getting involved, calling on the police chief to butt out. I don't think it's appropriate for bureaucrats to get involved in policy debate during an election campaign. The opposition leader says she'll determine how the extra police will be trained, but not until after the election. If you've got the determination, you can do it. Presumably, the cost of the extra police training will be met by the sell-off of the electricity industry. But the first full poll on the issue suggests it still lacks public support. According to a Herald AC Nielsen poll, the coalition is trailing the ALP by eight percentage points. Paul Mullins, 10 News. And another politician is in hot water over taxpayer-funded travel. Environment Minister Pam Allen and her family spent $18,000 on a week at Lord Howe Island, including more than $9,500 chartering a plane. Ms Allen claims she had a busy schedule on the island, but the opposition has been quick to condemn the expense. I think it probably indicates that this is a government out of touch with what people expect in terms of their politicians and their responsibilities for public funds these days. This is a beat up in the state election campaign. I believe that the trip to Lord Howe Island was entirely justified. A spokesman from the Minister's office confirms Ms Allen's partner and daughter accompanied her on the trip. Children's rights on the agenda today with the launch of a controversial new school kit. It tells students they don't have to wear a uniform or agree to bag searches. Going to school is about to become a lesson in civil rights, a new kit revealing when students can say no. 
It builds in a degree of accountability. Children need to be aware of where the thresholds are. The kit, which will be in all New South Wales schools, tells students that many of their teachers' demands are actually not legally binding. Produced by the National Children's and Youth Law Centre, it tells students where they stand on issues such as bag searches and confiscations, bullying, discipline and suspensions. But it's straightforward, it tells students what they really need to know. Definitely you're not going to have all students walking out or boycotting the, because they're just the laws. Questioning the authority of our teachers has prompted criticism from both sides of Parliament. I find this sort of kit particularly unhelpful. It's unhelpful for parents, it's unhelpful for teachers. It creates unrealistic expectations in students. We do have to be very, very careful not to undermine um, the, the legitimate authority that, that people like teachers and principals have to maintain discipline and good standards in schools. The producers and supporters of this kit insist they're not encouraging students to rebel, pointing out that although they do have legal rights, they also have a responsibility to obey reasonable school rules. Well, this is about respect, this is about people understanding what their roles and their responsibilities are, not just young people but teachers as well. Free legal advice is also being offered to students over the internet. Gisetta Hocking, 10 News. A heartbreaking vigil tonight for a Sydney family. They're watching over a mother of four who's in a coma after being dragged 50 metres by thieves who grabbed her handbag. Come on. Kamal Ali Come on, keeps watch over his wife Afaf in Liverpool Hospital's intensive care ward. She suffered brain damage in the vicious attack at Bonnie Rig Plaza. Kamal is comforting their sons, aware Afaf on life support will be lucky to live. They're crying and they're upset and they cannot attend the classes and and that adds into my duties as a father and a mother at the same time. And uh, but God helps us. Two other women have been hospitalised after recent bag snatches. This time, the driver of the stolen sedan pulled alongside Mrs Ali and grabbed her shoulder bag, his passenger watching for police. There is a message for other women in the way Mrs Ali was so brutally treated by the two men in the car. Her family now feels she was targeted because of the expensive gold jewellery and bracelets she was wearing at the time. They tried to grab her mainly for the gold. Their 12-year-old son. The stupid, dumb. And how special is your mum to you? Very special. I love her. Today, this mother of two travelled from Lakemba to show the family she cared. I just felt really sad and worried about what she's going through at the moment and her kids, like I heard she got four boys and it's just really sad. Harry Potter, 10 News. Grave fears tonight for a Sydney man among 13 tourists kidnapped by armed rebels in Uganda. Four other Australians managed to escape when the rebels raided the Bowindi National Park, the setting for the famed Gorillas in the Mist. These are the gorillas tourists expect to see when they travel to Uganda. Instead, an international tour group was confronted by more than a hundred Hutu gorillas, armed with guns, spears and machetes. French diplomat Anne Peltier says the rebels ransacked the camp for several hours. We had a lot of firing, but around the camp, you know. And then they, they, let, they asked the people to sit down, not to move. And then they wanted to take us to the mountains. So I tried to negotiate with them. Anne was then released along with four Australians. But others weren't so fortunate. Two Ugandans and a tourist were killed and 13 taken hostage, including three New Zealanders and 23-year-old Michael Baker from Sydney. This is in a very difficult and dangerous part of the world. Uh, he, there have been other kidnaps in the areas over recent years and we have great concerns for his safety. Australian consular officials are on their way to Uganda to try to negotiate his release. The rebels who fled Rwanda after the 1994 genocide are believed to have taken their captives into dense jungle. You never know with rebels what they are going to do, but I hope, in many hope they, they are going to release all the tourists. I hope so. It's my best wish. Tracy Spicer, 10 News. Back home, nightmare weather in Queensland. Motorists have been rescued and homes evacuated after flash flooding on the Gold Coast. The floodwaters rose without warning during the night. Swollen creeks burst their banks, cutting all major roads to the Gold Coast hinterland. 
Motorists were left stranded as the flash floods hit. It's gone over before, but never as bad as this. Emergency services raced to rescue numerous people trapped in vehicles. One car was washed away as it attempted to cross a flooded causeway. The driver rescued downstream. Out of stupidity, it's the worst I've seen flooding. Just, just like the speed of the water coming across the road didn't stand a chance, really. The rising waters also swept through low-lying homes. A woman and her five-year-old son had to be evacuated when their mudgery bar home was swamped. I was scared. You were scared. You woke up and lots of water was in there, wasn't it? Queensland's Sunshine Coast has been dealt a cruel blow by the weather. Devastated by floodwaters just over a fortnight ago, the community was today readying itself for another onslaught. And it was just like a river, and my yard was absolutely flooded. Then the water receded, and within an hour or so it was back again. Flood warnings remain current for northern New South Wales and Queensland's Gold and Sunshine Coasts. The Weather Bureau has forecast another six inches of rain to fall over the next 24 hours. David Murdoch, 10 News. And severe rain is also causing flooding in Melbourne. A fierce thunderstorm hit the city around midday, bringing traffic to a standstill and knocking out rail crossing gates. Power was cut to many parts of the city. Shops were flooded and homes damaged by the quick rising waters. Baggage handlers at Melbourne Airport refused to work in the bad weather, causing long delays for air travellers. And coming up next, the desecration of our hero's memory. An accused vandal faces court. Taking the meat out of pies, standards slide for an Aussie icon. A memory loss on the mobile, evidence of a brain drain. That story coming up at 5.29. This is 10's First at Five News Hour. Wollongong residents staged a street march today, staking their claim to a safer society. Residents and business leaders marched down Kira Street, the scene of last week's dramatic and tragic shootout. They insist the community wants an end to the violence and a return to a safe and peaceful city centre. A court appearance today for a Sydney teenager charged with defacing the Hyde Park War Memorial. Last month's attack cost the taxpayer an estimated $20,000. This is the youth accused of desecrating Sydney's War Memorial. 42 separate tags or graffiti signatures scrawled across all four walls of the treasured monument. Because of the outrage when it did occur, uh, the switchboard at Anzac House just lit up like a neon sign. It's the result of a wild half-hour spree of vandalism. The RSL believes society hasn't taught the young enough about our history. We failed them in the, the knowledge was not there when they were growing up in their formative years. That they didn't realise that there's a huge debt owed to the ex-service community. The 16-year-old is charged with willful damage and possession of an offensive implement, namely a pack of marker pens. Today he attended court for the first time, accompanied by his mother. The court heard the attack caused up to $20,000 damage. The teenager remanded to appear again later this month. Police are looking for at least two more youths in connection with the crime. Security at the War Memorial is to be upgraded following the attack. 24-hour cameras will monitor the site to prevent any repeat offence. There are plans to make those found guilty of such graffiti crimes clean up their own mess in full view of the public. Sean Fewings, 10 News. New food laws are threatening to make mincemeat of our great culinary favourite, the meat pie. It's no longer compulsory for our meat pies to have meat in them. Sparking fears they could soon be chock full of offal. Tongue tart, pancreas pie, kidney quiche. They could all be coming soon to the corner shop near you. Could you do it? No, I wouldn't. No, no, no way. No way in the world. The Great Aussie Pie is under threat because federal food regulators have loosened the screws on the meat bin. From now on, the 25% meat rule on all pies is gone, while the oven door has been opened to that one-time culinary taboo, offal, a.k.a. heart, lungs, tripe, spleen, you know what I mean. Call it what you like, I'll eat the lot. But not everyone's finding it so easy to swallow. 4 and 20, one of our biggest pie makers, lobbied hard against the changes for fear they could ruin the pie's reputation. There may be others that take advantage of it and do devalue the pie so that when consumers bite into the pie, they don't get the eat that they really want. 4 and 20 is confident most reputable makers will stick to the current system and says those who don't will quickly feel the backlash. 
But while most of us cringe at the thought of finding tripe or tongue nestled amongst our pastry, the health experts aren't too bothered. Dietitians say that while offal doesn't sound so good, it's often better for us than mince. It's not an inferior nutritional product. It does contain, you know, nutrients that are very essential in our diet. And, yeah, can't imagine, I mean, it's worth trying. But healthy or not, most Aussies, it seems, just can't stomach the idea of stomach. <laughs> I want meat in a meat pie, not everything else. Tracy Chamberlain, 10 News. Fair enough. And now another little Aussie icon. <laughs> Tim Bailey, good evening. Oh, Ronnie, next they'll be taking the sausages out of sausage rolls. What's going on? Doing the weather live tonight from the roof of the 10 News Centre. And we spied a bit of blue sky during the day, that uh, rare and often endangered species, it would seem. It's not going to hang around tomorrow. Unfortunately, we've got another grey day. The humidity will uh, keep on keeping on, and we're looking at around about 24, 25 degrees and the chance of a shower. Right now in the city, it's 24 degrees, and the outlook for the next six days, chance of a shower with some humidity and warming temperatures across your weekend. Back on the television at around about 5.35 with more weather. I'll see you then. Thank you, Tim. Ahead in the 10 News Hour, hopes for homeowners, interest rates in the balance. Also, could your mobile be causing uh, memory loss? And the fine line between pleasure and pain. Warnings about body piercing. Since Wednesday on 10. You're watching 10's First at 5 News Hour. The big question tonight, are interest rates coming down again? Latest economic figures have the experts divided. The nation is brimming with consumer confidence. Australians shopped till they dropped last month. Retail trade grew a near record 5.2%. Why is retail spending strong? Retail spending is strong. People have got money in their pockets as a result of low interest rates. But other news is decidedly worrying. A record current account deficit of close to $8 billion. This is a third set of bad figures within a very short space of time. The Treasurer's explanation, our export markets have shrunk. The downturn in Asia is the worst downturn we've seen in our lifetime. Adding to a grim picture, the building industry buffeted by an 8% fall in approvals. Both sides agree on one thing. Well, these figures should jolt the government out of its post-election complacency. There's no room for complacency. The Treasurer urges Labor to pass his tax package. The opposition urges him to ditch it. Tomorrow, the national accounts are expected to show Australia's growth slowing. Economists are divided on whether the Reserve Bank, whose board met today, will soon cut interest rates. But if growth in Australia does slow, the inflation outlook is so good that the Reserve Bank has room to cut rates if it's necessary to help the Australian economy. Paul Bongiorno, 10 News. The Australian government is considering sending Aussie peacekeepers to East Timor. The government says the United Nations team could be headed to our near neighbour. As Indonesia withdraws from East Timor, it's now expected Australian administrators will move in under the United Nations flag. Perhaps in time, um, some policing people as well under UN auspices. But peacekeeping forces are not yet included. Well, it's too early to be talking about Australian troops, far too early. With violence between pro-Indonesian and independence militias more frequent, the opposition wants our defence forces in there now. I'm saying troops, as we have committed ourselves in so many other theatres, uh, in order to keep the peace. We don't want at this stage to uh, send in heavily armed troops and uh, engage in ultimately some sort of a conflict. Labor's new gung-ho attitude compares to its policy since the Whitlam government of accepting the Indonesian takeover. That's now discredited by party leaders as morally wrong. A change which enraged the Labor icon who savaged the shadow foreign minister. I will not be blackguarded by this shallow shabby, shonky spokesman for foreign affairs. It's a fight Mr Brereton is trying to avoid. I'm sorry that Gough chose to get so personal, but I don't intend to go down that path. There should be a UN peacekeeping operation in the Labor Party to sort out the factions in the Labor Party, the bitterness in the Labor Party. It's made East Timor the most pressing foreign policy issue on both sides of politics. Paul Smith, 10 News. 
And at least 10 people have been killed in the latest clashes on Indonesia's riot-torn island of Ambon. The battle between Christians and Muslims is responsible for more than 160 deaths since mid-January. And there was another wave of violence late yesterday near a mosque. 15 homes were burned in that attack. Thousands of Muslim migrants have fled Ambon since the rioting erupted, many families trying to cram onto ships leaving the island. Raging floodwaters have killed at least two people and trapped others in Brazil. In an amazing display of nature's force, rivers poured over cars left stranded by the rising water levels. Motorists sitting on their vehicles were forced to clamber to safety. Others attempted to rescue a woman trapped in her car. The power of the floods took many by surprise after days of record torrential downpours. In all, one of Brazil's largest cities was clogged by more than 100 kilometres of traffic jams. Israel has warned it might attack guerrilla positions in southern Lebanon again after bombarding the region over the past 24 hours. The first funerals of four people killed by the guerrillas took place today. Israel retaliated for that ambush with a fierce artillery and air attack. Israel's defence forces released this video of one of their bombing runs. The guerrillas have their bases in southern Lebanon, where Israel also occupies a buffer zone. Prince Charles is under fire from health authorities. Their beef? The prince has eaten a piece of roast in public. The Prince of Wales arrived in Newport on St David's Day at a high-profile launch of a campaign to promote Welsh beef. Farming leaders and government ministers were among those on hand, eager to see the Prince express his support for British agriculture. One of the most controversial impacts of so-called mad cow disease was the government's decision taken 14 months ago to ban the sale of beef on the bone. But when presented with a joint of beef today still clearly on the bone, the Prince was more than happy to accept a slice of meat carved from it, as was the Welsh Secretary Alan Michael. And although the Prince wasn't aware in advance that he was going to be served a technically illegal joint of meat, it didn't appear to upset him. Welsh beef is a famous product. I should know, not only am I the proud owner of some Welsh black cattle, a most treasured 50th birthday present from the Welsh Black Cattle Society, but as you saw, I have just tasted uh, the product. And I can tell you that it is absolutely delicious and the Secretary of State can vouch safe for that as well. Nonetheless, despite the royal seal of approval for British beef, the government has said there are no plans to lift the ban on beef on the bone. Yet another attempt is underway to circumnavigate the world in a hot air balloon. Conditions were perfect as this latest team of Swiss and British balloonists prepared for departure in the Swiss Alps. It's the third attempt at the elusive record for one crew member their rivals have already got a 12-day start, but the balloonists are confident their trouble-free takeoff is a sign of things to come. Illness has forced Nicole Kidman to cancel the final performances of her hit Broadway play. Nicole had only eight shows left in the sold-out run of The Blue Room in New York, but a lingering bronchial infection has sidelined the Aussie star. She missed four performances last week and has now closed the show a week early because of the same infection. Mobile phones are under the microscope again with new fears that they cause memory loss and cancer. The claims come from British scientists who want their use curbed. At times it seems like everyone is on their mobile phone. More than 8 million people in Britain use them. In the first British research of its kind, volunteers in Bristol have been subjected to radiation from mobile phones for periods of half an hour at a time. Their memory and reactions are then measured by computer. The results of the study will be out next month. The concern focuses on the parts of the brain which control memory and learning. There's no evidence that microwave radiation from mobiles can damage the brain, but some scientists believe there are significant risks and are limiting their exposure. Uh, I'm not worried about uh, the thermal effects of, uh, of, of, of microwave radiation, but I, I might be more concerned about the effect it might have on the, uh, the electrical activity of the brain, whether that's short term or long term, we, we don't yet know. This is an earpiece for a mobile phone. You pop it in your ear like that, and there's a little microphone here you talk into, and that means any microwave radiation coming from the phone is nowhere near your head. Of course, what a lot of people do is they walk around with the thing in their top pocket or down in their trouser pocket, and then any microwave radiation coming from the phone is near other sensitive parts of the body. Manufacturers of mobile phones say they're safe and the public has nothing to fear, and certainly any health scares haven't affected sales of an item which is now an indispensable part of daily life for millions.
Italian fashion house Gianni Versace has upstaged its rivals at a parade in Milan. The format was familiar as Versace paraded its Versus line for winter 2000. The Off the Rack collection had all the colour and style fashion gurus have been applauding since the Versus line was launched. After the show, the icing on the cake, a concert by American rock star Lenny Kravitz. The band's drummer, possibly the first rocker to wear a Versace evening gown while performing. And coming up next in 10's First at Five News Hour, War Horses Roe and Ruxton team up to tackle drugs. And the Olympic Stadium's rush to be ready. Marsha Hines lends a helping hand. Time now for another quick look at the weather and Tim Bailey, quite a lot of grey around again today. Yes, still the cloud clings to New South Wales, Jess. What's happening is we've got a low pressure system off the north coast of New South Wales. We've got a trough in the west that is starting to move east and a lot of humidity and not much sunshine and the cloud kept the temperatures down across the state today as we check out what the maximum temps were and Lismore and Coffs Harbour shared 25 today, 21 at Tamworth, Dubbo 23, 22 at Orange, Newcastle 26, 31 a warm one at Wagga Wagga, Nowra 25 and likewise Bega. State's lowest recorded temp 7 at the Perisher Valley and 36 was the state's high at Broken Hill. The outlook for the next three or four days a shower or two, humidity and temperatures up around 25 to 26 degrees. More weather on your telly at 5 to 6. I'll rejoin you then. Thank you, Mr Bailey. Well, workers at the Homebush Olympic Stadium are braced for this weekend's acid test. The Rugby League showdown will attract massive crowds and big stars. As Marsha Hines arrived to help with preparations for Saturday's league doubleheader, she revealed that athletics was her other option for a career. But the American-born singer from a Jamaican family of athletes will enjoy the best of both worlds on Saturday when she takes centre stage at the Olympic Stadium. But if I wasn't a singer, I think I would have been a, a sprinter. I would try to have been a sprinter anyway. She admits it'll be intimidating performing before her biggest audience and a record rugby league crowd. This is a bit daunting, I must say, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> it'll be one thing to hear the roar of 110,000 spectators, but when just as many stomachs start to rumble, the stadium's kitchens will be ready. It's the minimum standard, what they will see, and we will take it from there and we will lift it up all, all the way to the Olympics. The caterers have been given just five days to prepare and had been expecting a crowd of just 60,000. The service will still be there and, and of course it will be at such a high level, but please understand that there are difficulties. It is still a building site. As the cooking continues, the kitchens are still being fitted out. The technology, a far cry from 20th century relics like the humble hot dog stand. Adam Walters, 10 News. The drug debate has hotted up. The RSL brought into the row today, accusing politicians of being weak need, even labelling state leaders drug pushers for their support of a heroin trial. Not shy of a public stoush, Normie Rowe has again come out swinging. We were spending $12 billion in defence, keeping young Australians as safe as possible in Vietnam, and we were still losing 50 per year. We're losing 600 now. He can't tolerate talk of a heroin trial or those who support the proposal, including Jeff Kennett and the ACT's Kate Carnell. She's pushing for more drugs. She's a drug pusher. A pharmacist, Ms Carnell, has long championed a drug trial in the nation's capital. It'll show ways that we can medically pro provide heroin to people who are currently pushing to our kids, people who are currently ripping off our stereos. While harshly critical of drugs and trials which are touted as magic bullet remedies, the RSL advocates a battle plan targeting not so much the user, but the heroin pusher. Those foreigners, and there's plenty of them, who aren't Australian citizens pushing drugs in this country, they ought to be picked up and sent on the first rocket back to where they came from. The RSL has suggested more money for customs operations, better resource police drug units, and even the introduction of military surveillance techniques to catch the dealers. We're greatly concerned about the, uh, the uh, backing down, as it were, the uh, going to water at the knees by uh, a number of uh, eminent figures in this country. State and territory leaders will have their chance to respond 
At this Friday's drug summit, a heroin trial is high on the meeting's agenda. Kirsty Bozeman, 10 News. And health fears tonight over one of the 90s biggest fashion fads. Experts warn that body piercing can cause deadly infections. It's been around for centuries, but now body piercing is becoming a fashionable accessory. And for some die-hard devotees, there aren't many body parts left untouched. In some ways it's hit the mainstream and navel piercings have become like ear piercings. It's, it's just something that um, people do, much like colouring their hair. But initially it started off as an, an individual expression. But there are some deadly dangers with body piercing. An American man's infection from ear piercing leaving him under the surgeon's knife for open heart surgery. Without precautions like sterilisation and professional care, fatal diseases can easily spread. You've got the hepatitis uh, B and C which is a major problem but also all other bacteria can come in there and uh, become a major problem as well. Just as when you go to the dentist or a hospital to make sure that people know what they're doing and that they're cleaning their instruments right and doing everything right. Dr Varan says people should consult their GP before the piercing and keep in regular contact afterwards to ensure there's no infection. Natasha Belling, 10 News. Larger than life today, federal opposition leader Kim Beasley unveiled in portrait form. The work of per Perth artist Ruth O'Connor. The painting is shortlisted for the prestigious Archibald Prize to be announced later this month. The $15,000 portrait depicts a relaxed Labor leader, far from the hustle of Parliament House. But unlike other Archibald Prize subjects, this one never considered I going nude. Come within the meaning of obscenity. <laughs> <laughs> Some things you've got to be careful of. Sport now with Bull Woods. Uh, Bull Woods. Bull Woods. <laughs> I don't know. It caught me off guard. And another blow for the Wallabies' World Cup hopes. That's true, Ron. Uh, Jason Little rocked by news from his specialist. We'll have more on that shortly. Plus the Formula One driver who's sick of playing second fiddle. And instant grass solves a safety problem for league's debut at the Olympic Stadium. Workmen at Stadium Australia are racing the clock to be ready for Saturday night's history-making rugby league opening. Officials have reacted quickly to concerns the ground is too short and narrow. For most of the players, it's going to be the experience of a lifetime. The St George Illawarra Dragons players had to pinch themselves. It's hard to believe they're involved in such a history-making experience. Opening the new complex with 110,000 fans brings enormous pressure and expectations. It's going to be faster than a lot of these other players, the younger players in the team have played in. But, um, you know, you're just going to have to hang in there and you're going to play under fatigue for most of the game. In the twilight of his career, Mark Coyne will lead the newly formed Dragons onto the field against Parramatta. One of the highlights of my career and you don't sort of realise until you're actually out in the middle of it and look around at you know, the empty stadium and realise how good it's going to be when it's full. It's, it's going to be a terrific experience. With such a big crowd, communicating with each other on field will be almost impossible. Maybe actually I've been doing a bit of training working on that, actually just running, running without making any calls to get used to it because it's going to be very hard to hear. It's ironic that the biggest sporting stadium in Australia would have the smallest rugby league field area. There's a shortage of grass in terms of length and width on the main area. With the players' welfare the main concern, the in-goal area has been lengthened with high-tech grass sewn into mats. The sideline area too is being expanded by an extra two metres to cover players being tackled into touch. No football fields fit inside the... Uh... Olympic 400 metre track, even though they might tell you that in Melbourne, mm -hmm. they don't fit. That's not a full-size footy field. Uh, this one is being made a full-size footy field. The synthetic grass will be lifted up and dried out each week until after the Olympics. Tony Peters, 10 years. First it was Wallaby captain John Eels. Now Waratah centre Jason Little will miss the Super 12 series after fracturing his collarbone in South Africa. He's in some danger of missing the World Cup later this year. This is the before and after shot Jason Little dreaded. He'd gone to see a Brisbane specialist hoping for good news. But re-emerged with a shattering diagnosis. Originally they said four to six weeks and now they're saying eight to ten uh, minimum. So it just depends how things go um, in the next couple of weeks. have another x-ray in three weeks and to see how it goes. 
suffered in the dying moments of the Waratahs. 13 all draw with the Coastal Sharks. The injury will cost him almost the entire Super 12 series, jeopardising his World Cup hopes. I guess if you don't play Super 12, it's a little bit hard to get selected for World Cup, so a little bit disappointing, but uh, hopefully things will heal well and I'll, I'll get back on the field later in the season. Little had arrived back in Australia in fine spirits last night after yet another jinx tour to South Africa. I just got tackled and, and kind of a spear tackle and we both landed on top of me and, and my shoulder went first in the ground and it, it gave away a little bit, so uh, just right towards the end of the game, uh, unfortunately. And, so I guess that's the way it goes. Just uh, disappointing to happen at this time of the year and being a World Cup year. In four provincial trips to the Republic, nice. Little Thank has only friend. come home once uninjured. Russell Fairfax, 10 News. Cricket and Australian spinner Stuart McGill continues to pressure selectors. He's taken 13 wickets in the win over the West Indian President's 11. After taking six wickets in the first innings, McGill went one better, conceding only 29 runs, a career best. Shane Warne joined the assault, taking the remaining three. Australia winning by an innings and six runs. Australia has the spin dilemma, but the West Indies selectors are looking to speed, naming six pace men in their first test squad. Veterans Kirtley Ambrose and Courtney Walsh will lead the attack at Queen's Park, but the Windies are missing two senior batsmen. Carl Hooper's unavailable. He's staying in Adelaide with his Australian wife and their son, who's ill, while Shivereen Shanderpaul has a shoulder injury. Australian Harry Kuehl has turned in a man-of-the-match performance in England's Premier League, helping Leeds United to an important win over Leicester. Kuehl's partnership with Jimmy Floyd Hasselback troubling Leicester, the Socceroo opening the score in the 26th minute. Now Leeds needed a win to move into fourth on the ladder and looked to Kuehl once again. This time Leicester had him covered but Leeds finished on top 2-1. Their UEFA Cup qualifying hopes still alive. In the countdown to the Australian Formula One Grand Prix, McLaren driver David Coulthard says he's tired of playing second fiddle to teammate Mika Hakkinen. Coulthard was third in last year's Drivers' Championship. I'm not out there to you know, just support my teammate. I want to be winning Grand Prix and I want to, to win the ultimate goal, which is a World Championship. A veteran of 74 Formula One starts, David Coulthard believes it's his turn. His turn to show he's got what it takes. I'm in Formula One, I'm with McLaren, not because I've paid my way there or because, you know, my father owns a team. I'm there because I've proven throughout my racing career that I can compete at the highest level and, and win Grand Prix. Only one win last season for Coulthard. It could have been two. A controversial pre-race agreement at Albert Park saw him hand the chequered flag to McLaren teammate and eventual drivers champion Mika Hakkinen. A move since outlawed by the sport. Obviously the first race here in Melbourne didn't help things in terms of my own championship. And then a few races after that, it seemed to be every time I was leading, I'd have a mechanical problem. This will be Coulthard's sixth year of Formula One. He says his best is yet to come. In Prost and Mansell's case, uh, they were 39 and 40 years old. So I'm 27 now. I'd like to think that I'm only going to get better. There's no physical reason at the moment why I should be any worse. Coulthard confident a solid winter's testing combined with a bit of luck will see him the pace setter this year. I've won Grand Prix. You know, I've beaten Michael, I've beaten Mika. I just need to do it consistently with a reliable package. Coulthard may be confident, but Benetton's Alexander Wirtz doesn't share his optimism. Wirtz tipping a successful year for Ferrari. I don't want to say, but I would bet my money on my career. While Alex Zanardi, back in Formula One after a stint with the Indy cars, believes his Williams is going to be very hard to beat. I don't think it makes sense to compete for, for the second place. Yeah. You've got to go for the best. Brad McEwen, 10 News. To cycling and Australian rider Liz Tadic scored a very important stage win in the Tour de Snowy despite slipping out of her pedal just minutes before the finish. The 22-year-old Victorian controlled the 83-kilometre fourth stage, powering away from the field with a strong burst just 20 kilometres into the journey. Olympic gold medalist Cathy Watt launched an unsuccessful attack on the lead pack before Tadic's foot slipped out with just 250 metres left. Undeterred, she regained the lead, edging out England's Sarah Symington right on the line. That's all for now. Later in sports tonight, the Brisbane Broncos still chasing a major sponsor and we'll chat with Alex Zanardi about the Australian Grand Prix. Jessica. Thank you, Bill. And coming up after the break, Tim Bailey's weather report and TEN's finance news. Plus, a mascot causing mayhem, the bull that wouldn't play ball. <laughs>
And now for a more detailed look at the weather, here's Tim Bailey. Thanks, Ronnie. Well, greyer than a truckload of Solvo around Sydney town and all of New South Wales in the past three or four days. And the Bureau is saying we haven't seen the last of the overcast, folks. Unfortunately, that cloud band right across all of the state, sweeping up to Queensland and in the Northern Territory, going absolutely nowhere. Tomorrow in Sydney, we should have a shower or two and then maybe moderate to heavy rainfall, and that'll be the same for Newcastle as well. So things looking a bit crook. The weekend, there'll be a bit of a, a, a rise in temperatures, thank goodness and humidity and hopefully a bit of sunshine. It tried hard today but lost the battle. Let's do minimum and maximum temperatures. They are on your television now, 18.3 through to 25.6. And current temps about the Greater Sydney area look like this. Richmond, 22, 18 at Katoomba and 24 popular at Bankstown, Mascot and in the city right now. Relative humidity, 74% in the CBD, rising to 83% at Richmond. The wind, 14k an hour of easterly over Sydney, 8k an hour, just a zephyr of southerly at Richmond. The barometer, 1,012 hectopascals and falling. Sea temperature around about 23, 24 degrees. On the latest satellite photo, a large area of cloud covers much of Queensland and New South Wales and also extends as far north as as the Darwin area. On the weather map, a low is situated just off the New South Wales north coast, while a trough is located across the west of the state and is moving slowly east. A weak frontal system is also approaching Adelaide. Wednesday, the business of the Broly. Rain areas and showers expected across eastern Australia with heavier falls likely about the coastal regions. Showers and isolated thunderstorms continue across the northern tropics. And on Thursday, activity across New South Wales is expected to gradually contract to the eastern half of the state while shower and thunderstorm activity continues across the tropics. So we're unlikely to see an improvement as far as the grey v the blue is concerned over the next three or four days. Our best chance looks to be around about Friday and Saturday where our temperatures will rise and uh, we, we're in for a shower or two or a thunderstorm late in the piece but hopefully some sunshine and that rarity some blue sky as well let's go into state and see how they're faring in the capital cities and uh, tomorrow brisbane doing it the rain at times way 27 mostly fine in canberra hobart showers and storms likewise melbourne fine in adelaide and in perth and a late shower and storm in darwin and a fine one in the alice showers for lismore and coffs harbour tomorrow showers and the chance of a storm for tamworth dubbo and orange showers and it could get worse in newcastle possible heavy falls a few showers and storms in wagga wagga showers in nara and a few showers too in bega 24 on the central coast gosford richmond 26 20 at katoomba tomorrow. Bankstown 26 and 24 at the Gong. Forecast for Sydney. Cloudy and humid conditions continue with shower activity expected to become more frequent during the day. Top of 25. Sun rising 6.44. Setting at 7.30. Showers Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Late storm Sunday. Shower to Monday. Morning shower Tuesday. Dear oh dear. I can't do a thing about it folks. See you tomorrow night. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. Now we'd like you to meet Maradona the Bull. He's the mascot for Swiss soccer team FC Zurich. The only problem is Maradona didn't want to play ball, deciding instead that he preferred the view from the stands. His mad dash to flee the stadium cleared the seats and led officials on a merry chase. And like his namesake, Maradona was all hooves, allowing handlers to finally corner him. The Bull was adopted after being saved from the slaughterhouse. Today's antics didn't help the team, though. They didn't get within a bull's roar of their opponents, losing 2-0. And that's the 5 o'clock news. I'm Ron Wilson. And I'm Jessica Rowe. Sandra Sully will have the late news at 10.30. Good night. Good night.